Welcome back. A report compiled in 2017 called The Future of Water Security in South Africa and SADC says the region is headed for a serious water crisis that may lead to conflict and political instability. The water shortages are already being experienced in some parts of the country. Dr. T.K. Poe joins me via Skype from Bonn, Germany, and he is joining me to talk about this crisis that's facing our nation. Dr. Poe, pleasure to have you talk to us about this problem that's facing us at the moment. And, and this, uh, this report was compiled in 2017. What were you seeing then already? No, thank you for having me, uh, Mr. Mudisa. Uh, it was done in conjunction with my colleague, Mr. Maris Ustazen from Gibbs, and another gentleman um, by the name of Mr. Tim. And what we saw, I think, was at that time, people were concentrating more on electricity and uh, the blackout that we were experiencing. But then uh, what we were thinking is, if it could happen to electricity, why cannot that not happen to water? And there were murmurs, especially around some municipalities in the northwest province, I think you'd know about, where water was really becoming quite problematic. And we started to actually just project, if this could happen to uh, most municipalities in rural areas, how far before it would come to the rest of your South African municipalities? So it was just maybe taking a projection of what was happening, because South African politics and policy, we always only experience problems when they come to metropolitan metropolitan areas, but there's always a clue when you look at uh, rural municipalities as to what's happening. Just give me a sense, a picture of the water situation in South Africa and the region at this time, given that uh, we are generally a dry region, even though some people think that we receive adequate rains when it's summer, but that's not necessarily the case. If you came to South Africa as a foreigner, you'd assume that we live in probably one of the most water-rich places in the world, which is not the case. In, in most instances, we actually are just always hanging by when it comes to water. And when you look at the rest of the region, it's no better. Hence, you've been able to see places like Zimbabwe and Botswana go through their, through their droughts. So what's also becoming quite problematic is the fact that it's becoming quite annually. Where we used to be able to predict when the rains were coming, we are unable to do that on a more consistent basis due to things like global warming. So the key question I think what we, we've been missing is, this occurrence of uh, water shortages due to droughts and other reasons should have been picked up a bit quicker, but we've not been able to pick it up. And I think people have been counting on mega projects such as uh, the Inca Dam from the DRC, which has not really come to tuition and fruit. So what we've actually been experiencing is, I think, I'll call it, uh, for lack of a better word, a lack of water knowledge, basic water knowledge as in terms of what is our geographical situation, what is our regional situation in the SADC area. And I think we've also been a bit confused by the fact that we know we've got two oceans besides us, but we've not been able to have the right technology, which is desalination. So I think that really does confuse the average person and I think also the average planner in South African politics when it comes to water. So I think it's just an issue of been, there's been a general lack of awareness and also the, how we also preserve water in South Africa. I'm sure you've gone to many places in South Africa where you ask yourself, how is it that these uh, water has just been allowed to run when the, depths, when, the, when the pipes have been burst, which also gives, a, I think, a false consciousness around the South African population that we've got water abundance, which is clearly not the case. Well, I think people, are re uh, people reason that way because the feeling is that we've always had water. Where would this water have gone to? But besides the questions of nature and climate, what is happening in terms of, let's call them man-made problems around water provision and supply? It, it, it speaks to the problem of, I'll just put it into three quick ones, which is infrastructure. We've not really updated a lot of our inf infrastructure when it comes to water. Hence, a lot of rural municipalities, pipes, and just your basic systems have not been upgraded, which creates a lot of leakages within the system. And secondly, in terms of how we get water to people, we, we, we were actually a bit behind the times. We were working on the assumption that a lot of the infrastructure, again, which we have, is able to readily and quickly, and, 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 and in a way, a false assumption that there's an abundance of it. And also, and I think maybe this speaks more to mega projects, the issues of how we conserve water in South Africa. We've not been very innovative about how we conserve it. We still use a lot of open uh, open dams, which is to say we allow a lot of evaporation to happen within our dams. We have not yet looked at solutions, which are there, to be able to put water into underground dams. So we're still using old technology for what is a ever escalating problem. What role do you think um, the big industries and mining have played in water wastage that is taking place in South Africa? I'm thinking of 
water, uh, I mean, acid drain or, or you know, uh, uh, and the water drainage systems in the greater Vetvatasaran area? Uh, they've actually played a huge role. Uh, by that I mean, we, uh, in most instances when we give out licenses, one of the things that are probably asked for a lot of is, can you guarantee us that there's water? Because water is one of the main resources needed when you need to run a mine. But I think we have not really been able to ask the question, yes, we'll give you water as mines, but how are you going to be able to also ensure that, listen, the water we're giving you, or maybe we, the negotiations we do when it comes to this mining and water is of such a level and point that they, you are not basically using all of it and you're not actually endangering the region and the area you, you're basically mining in. And we've, I think, been quite poor at this. And one, as you, you highlighted the fact of our acid drain mineage, especially in Gauteng, we have not really come to grips with what does this mean as a business process. We work on the old assumption that I, you come, you get the license, you, you, I as a mining company will ask for the guarantee of water and I will give it to you. So it's just maybe all systems and processes which we have not really updated to actually understand the fact that we can't readily just give you water in the same way we used to in the 90s and 80s for you to open a mine. Well, you've worked at local level here in South Africa. What did you see when you were working for Citibank and you were here in Gauteng? What, what did you see at the municipal level, the management of the scarce water resource and the distribution thereof? I'll, I'll speak of the current climate I know, which is the fact that we have not, again, invested in engineers. When you speak about water management at local government level, especially if you look at an area like the Val, you'd assume that you know water would be foremost in our in our in our leaders' uh, mindset, but that's not the case. As I'm sure you remember, last year we've had to actually call in the military to actually assist us in actually cleaning up the Val Dam, which speaks to the fact that there's not been oversight in terms of how industry and even how the government is actually monitoring how places like the Val Dam have been used. Heads at the moment, if you go to the Val Dam now, you're probably going to one of the most polluted areas and water areas in the whole of South Africa. So again, it speaks to poor oversight. And also, we're not hiring the right skill. And by that, I mean it to actually just educate a water engineer, get them into the system, ensure that they're well qualified, get them to understand the international politics of water, we're very behind. We speak about a 10 to 12 year process. And in that process, it's not to say that everything stays the same. As you know, uh, the world of water and the environment is dynamic. So you're basically getting these people in if you're able to get them in at first, because remember you're competing with the private sector to get them the same person. So we're actually quite behind the times. And that's what one, I, one of the things I've seen when you look at what's happening in the Val when it comes to the water shortage and, and crisis. Your comments regarding the investment in water infrastructure, for instance, uh, you know, what is your view? How, how is South Africa going about investing in the, the infrastructure, dams and so forth, as well as the reticulation of water? I'd say that there's, there, there's still not great clarity about it. I would be lying if I was saying the government has not put money into it. Government has put money into it. But it's like the issue of education. You putting money into it doesn't guarantee you're going to get the positive outcome unless you put in the proper systems and processes in place to actually ensure you follow up this investment. And I think that's the actual problem, the fact that we're not following up with Ian's investment. And if you look at the department itself, they've actually, the department, especially water affairs, after I think for the last 10 years, it's actually been poorly managed. And this poor management has now seeped into how we basically look after water. So if I had to use that as a gauge, my, my, I'd put a simple prognosis and say we've not done a good job, or the government has not done a good job in following up the investments. A lot of times you'll hear, and even Treasury will give money to it, but I think there's just been a poor oversight and follow-up into how the department actually looks into it. And if you need any more proof of this, you just have to look at rural municipalities where people actually have been denied a basic right like water. So how damaging is this going forward? What risks do you see? Uh, uh, three key risks. One, if you, I mean, for just you and I as a basic consumer of water and as an individual, no water, no life. It doesn't come any more simple than that. Secondly, if you're an international investor who wants to really put up roots in the South African economy, why would you invest in a place where they can't even look after basic water? And thirdly, and I, and I think probably this is most scary for us, and we touched on it in the report, is the issue of health. As you know, once you cannot basically look after your water situation, water bed 
uh, diseases and, and viruses will come to the tuition and fruit. And that's what actually worries me more. The fact that we have not looked at the biological side of what this crisis will mean for us in South Africa. If it's one thing to be able to sort out the first two, but if you cannot actually look after the quality of water, and if you cannot really make sure that the water you and I take for granted, which is coming out of a tap, has really gone through proper standards and procedures, uh, you're going to be in quite the, the dilemma. And we're not talking about something you can easily sort out, because when you speak about biological problems caused by, I'd say, negligence and other factors, I, none of us can give you a straight answer in terms of how long it would take us to sort that out. So what do you recommend then in your report following the analysis, the research that you have conducted, you've identified and isolated the problems, but have you got ideas of how we can fix this situation, how we can manage? I'll just pick about three, some of which we spoke about in the report. Firstly, I will start at a macro level. We need to really change how we store and manage water in South Africa. And this, I think, will need a lot of investment into getting away from the mentality of saying we just need to build dams and leave water there. This might, as I said, stated, mean we might have to look at options of building dams, uh, retaining our water underground rather than open cars. Secondly, we need a proper skills and audit in the department to actually look at if we had to look at basically it's making a summary cost of how much would it take for us to actually invest into local government and rural areas to get water levels to a, a, a process in the system where we can actually account to find out what the problem is because what my one of our worries was in the in the process is that we spoke to various water engineers is that the fact that we've allowed the problem to escalate for the last 10 years means we don't really have a proper grasp of what's the problem. And secondly, and I think lastly, is it's just basically you and I as individuals need to be re-educated on how we use and how we understand water. It's unfair, again, to have to ask this every South African citizen, as we always ask, to, to have to pick up the slack. But it is important that we start to think when we're building houses, when we're building cities and towns, how are we going to use this water and what do we need to do? And I think that's very much lacking in, in, in the infrastructure. It will require you and I, when we also start buying houses, to actually start asking developers, listen, it's good. I love the size of this house. I love the fact that you put a lovely green yard, but how am I going to be able to water this and how much is this going to cost? And could you maybe not make it, you know, put in a lot of maybe fake grass and fake flowers rather than you expecting me to live on a golf course estate? So it's going to become you and I really starting to demand. And I think that's probably the biggest thing we need to start doing as South African individuals, that we need to start demanding more of ourselves and also more of our developers and also cities and municipalities, more answers regarding how we develop water. Just a brief comment from you. What is your view of how the authorities are managing the water situation? I, I can't say one has got great confidence at the moment in the fact that if you think earlier on in January, again, going back to Northwest, because that's a province I, I know probably better than most, is that we, I don't think we've really made great strides into it. And I always use the barometer of looking at what the Auditor General says about how municipalities spend and allocate resources. In truth, a lot of these municipalities really don't have the requisite fun, funding at the moment to take on mega projects when it comes to water. It really is the domain of national government. And if I were just to briefly look at a lot of our policies, I think we're still a bit ignorant when it comes to water. The only time water comes to the fore is now when we're having a crisis. And I think that's the wrong mentality to have. So if I just had to use that as a broad asset, I think we're very poor at water leadership. And I think we really need a total new thinking when it comes into it in terms of how we do it at home, how we do it in industry. Uh, and until we do that, I think we're going to be heading towards a slow crisis, which yeah. unfortunately is the one we can't replace. Dr. T.K. Poe, thank you very much for joining us and talking to us about the report that you helped compile. It's called The Future of Water Security in South Africa and SADC. He's currently based in Germany, but there he is with the insights that we need here in South Africa. We also wanted you to be aware of uh, the water crisis that is potentially going to be one of the major threats facing this nation going forward.